Welcome. This is the e-learning course on the Nibbana Sermons 1 to 11 by Bhikkhu Katakurunda Nyanananda, hosted by the Numata Center for Buddhist Studies at the University of Hamburg in collaboration with the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies in Massachusetts. And today we are on to Sermon 2. But before coming to that, I want to first make a few comments on the discussion that we had regarding Lecture 1. Sermon 1, and I really appreciate the rich and interesting discussion by the participants on the forum. In fact, the discussion is so rich that I am not really able to fully reflect what has been going on here, and so I just have to content myself to take up a few points in relation to the two main topics that I identified. Uh, from lecture one, which is the fire imagery for Nibbana and name. The fire imagery has been uh, skillfully related to the idea of forest fires by Anne Dillon and Linda Grace and also Katrina Bergbauer. And I found this very useful because it brings the whole imagery more alive, the, the danger of fire. And Kim Allen also pointed out the relationship to the fire sermon, the Adita Sutta, uh, which was also mentioned by Hendrik, the discourse given by the Buddha to former fire worshippers. And Margaret Roman asked where the freedom lies in view of the interdependence of wood and fire. And I think the freedom lies in the cessation of it, in the dependence, in the cessation of conditionality. Then the topic of name. Rood pointed out that there are different definitions of name in the Visuddhi Manga and uh, Abhidhamata Sangha. And Simon Adam Lennart noted that the mind and the understanding that Nama Rupa refers to mind and matter has a relation to the Abhidharma. Mikens offered us Mahasi's description of Namarupa Parichidanyana. And Hu Chang Hu Chao sorry wondered where all this comes from and how it relates to the development of the Abhidharma. And so I thought I speak a little bit about this. I have uh, discussed this in my uh, comparative study of the Majimanika, of which you have PDFs on page 71, note 221. And uh, the early meaning of Nama is still found in the Vibhanga, the second work of the canonical Abhidharma, which lists only the aggregates of feeling, perception, and formations. In fact, even the Visuddhimagga does not include consciousness under name when it discusses dependent arising. And the commentary on the Vibhanga explains that only three mental aggregates are mentioned here in this in such context, because if consciousness were to be included, it would make consciousness self-conditioning, which is of course not possible. So it is only in relation to the insight into Nama Rupa, Nama Rupa Paricheda, that the Visuddhimagga employs Nama as a covering term for all four immaterial aggregates. And Venomanyana Moli has pointed out a similar shift between different understandings of Nama also found in the Net and Dipakarana. So my own understanding is that uh, this relates to the beginning of the Abhidharma. And in a book uh, entitled Dawn of Abhidharma, of which we, I will make a PDF available to the participants, I have discussed it in more detail. Basically, my understanding is that uh, in line with the shift of understanding of the nature of the Buddha as somebody who is omniscient, we also get this tendency of reflecting this idea of omniscience in the attempt to construct a complete map, to, 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 to build up a, 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 an entire system. And I would consider early Buddhism to be prescriptive rather than descriptive. Prescriptive in the sense that only the absolutely necessary type of information is given for us to walk the path. 
but with later tradition there is this attempt of constructing a complete map that describes all possible details probably motivated by the feeling that the master is no longer there and so it is important to gather all information together uh, to make sure that others can still find the path but with this drive towards constructing a comprehensive map then sometimes things get lost and I think name is a good example for that the definition of name that uh, original meaning gets lost by making it just a covering term for anything mental. Then another comment on name by Robert Grosch was whether the sequence of the five um, mentioned in the definition of name has any significance. And I am not aware of anyone who has commented on this except actually for the Venerable Jnananda and I wanted to present this is from his book on, on dependent arising so it is not part of the Nibbana sermon and I just wanted to read out the relevant part and then also present my own understanding this is on page 41 so he relates these five to the five fingers of the hand and then he starts with the little finger this is how I call the small but mischievous little finger, feeling. <coughs> then comes number two, the ring finger, where you wear the signet ring. Well, call it perception. Now for number three, bend the decisive middle finger, prominent and intrusive. See how it digs into your palm. Let us call it intention. He is the one who calls the waiter and silences a meeting. You do your work when intention steps in. Number four is the index finger, fussy and buzzy all the time. You may dub it contact. What comes last is number five, the thumb, standing apart but approachable to the rest, as lexicons define it. Take it as attention. So have this at your fingertips, this definition of name. I really like this simile and I have my own and I have adopted it myself in teaching and so I would like to also present my uh, version of it. So if we take the five fingers of the hand and we start with feeling, then feeling is really so easily overlooked. It's the smallest of all these fingers, but it is so fundamental because it is that initial affective input of liking or disliking, pleasant, unpleasant or neutral, that sets the course for the rest of the, what is going to happen in the mind. And with that first input of feeling going for influencing perception, perception is where our initial likes and dislikes, our ideas and projections get married to sense data. We know from modern research in cognitive psychology that most of what we perceive as coming from the outside in actual fact is to a considerable part based on our own memories and projections. And this is also well known in, by police that eyewitnesses reports given in all honesties differ substantially simply because people much of what they think they see, hear, experience is actually part of mental projection. And so with this build up from feeling to perception, then we come to intention. The whole thing builds up and intention is the longest of these fingers. It's where things really stick out. This is where karma comes in. We take our decisions here and we have to bear the consequences. And so these three uh, follow actually the same sequence as the three aggregates. And then there comes contact, which is what points to things and which is where mind gets kind of sticks into matter in a way and I'll say more on contact when I finish the simile and then attention is that which decides what is going to be the object of this whole process this is where things get grabbed so let us say if I have this as material form Rupa and then name takes hold of it and then we have consciousness and now we can write the name. 
this is how I like to picture this consciousness and name and form. And there's something more to be said on contact because several participants uh, commented on this. So Kach Hung said that it almost does not seem to be a, a mental factor because contact can also happen when two cars collide. And that is true. I mean, material things can be in contact with each other. And if nobody is there to cognize this, then it is simply a material process. But here we are talking from a phenomenological perspective. And so what for us is important is always the mental side. And then Hu Chao and Yin Cheng and Malik Samarasinghe also commented on this idea of resistance. And to appreciate that, I think we have to take resistance together with designation. As pointed out by Simon Adam Lennart, Nama and Rupa, they occur together. They do not occur apart from each other. So it is not possible uh, to stay with my simile for consciousness and, 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 and form to, to, to get into contact unless name grabs hold of form in order to impact consciousness. There is, from an early Buddhist viewpoint, it is not possible for consciousness on its own to experience matter or materiality. And this differs somewhat from the later commentary understanding where uh, tranquility and insight are seen as being separate forms of meditation based on whether one takes a concept or an ultimate reality as the object. So if a concept is involved, <coughs> this means uh, one is necessarily doing tranquility. And in order to cultivate insight, one needs to have as one's object ultimate realities. And so, for example, the elements earth, water, fire, and wind would be ultimate realities. But, uh, and, and this is certainly a very uh, meaningful approach, but uh, it does not correspond to the early Buddhist position. In early Buddhism, Nibbana is the only ultimate reality. And an experience of uh, materiality without any kind of concept is not feasible, because contact involves the resistance just as much as the designation. So this was what I had by way of introduction, and now I think we can get into the second sermon. Itang santang itang panitang yadidang sab sankara samato sab upadi patini sango tanhaka yobirago nirudho nipanam. This is peaceful, this is excellent namely the stilling of all preparations, the relinquishment of all assets, and the destruction of craving, detachment, cessation, extinction. With the permission of the most venerable great preceptor in the assembly of the venerable meditative monks, the second sermon on Nibbana has come up for today. Towards the end of our sermon the other day, we raised the point why is it improper to ask such questions as <clears throat> what is the purpose of Nibbana? Why should one attain Nibbana? Our explanation was that since the holy life or the noble eightfold path has Nibbana as its ultimate aim, since it gets merged in Nibbana, any questions as to the ultimate purpose of Nibbana would be inappropriate. In fact, at some places in the canon, we find the phrase Anuttara Brahmacharya Pariyusana used with reference to Nibbana. It means that Nibbana is the supreme consummation of the holy life. The following standard phrase announcing a new Arahant is very often found in the suttas. Yasataya Kulaputta Sammat Eva Agarasma Anagariyam Pambajanti Tadanuttarang Brahmacharya Pariyosanang Viteva Dhamme Sayang Abhinya Sanchikatva Upasampadya Vihasi. In this very life, he realized by his own higher knowledge and attained to that supreme consummation of the holy life, 
for the purpose of which clansmen of good family rightly go forth from home to homelessness. Comment. I uh, would like to just support this ultimate purpose of Nibbana, that Nibbana is the ultimate purpose of the teachings with a little story. This is a um, discourse from the Agamas on how the Buddha led his own son Rahula to awakening. And I will make the, my translation and study of that also available. And the, the, the Pali version does not describe what happened before the Buddha actually uh, uh, gave instructions to Ravala, but the Chinese gives us details. And it's very beautiful that the Buddha sees that his son is not yet ready for the breakthrough. So he tells him to give teachings, and he tells him to give teachings on dependent arising, on the five aggregates, etc. And every time Ravala gives teachings to others, and then he comes back and says, yes, Bhante, I have given these teachings and now I would like to get my own instructions. The Buddha says, well, teach on that other. And when he comes back again, the Buddha says, good, now you go into silence, into seclusion and reflect on these topics that you have been teaching about. And when Rahula is in seclusion and reflecting, he suddenly realizes all these teachings point to Nibbana. And when he comes back and reports that to the Buddha, the Buddha realizes, oh, now he is ready to get instructions. And he leads him to liberation. And this is very beautifully encapsulates uh, an important point in that I think all the teachings in one way or another point to Nibbana. That is what they're all concerned with. End of comment. Now, what is the justification for saying that one attains to Nibbana by the very completion of the holy life? This Noble Eightfold Path is a straight path. Ujjuko nama somakgo abhaya nama sadisa. This path is called the straight, and the direction it goes is called the fearless. Comment, just offering the translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. The straight way that path is called, and fearless is its destination. End of comment. In the Indivutaka, we come across a verse which expresses this idea more vividly. Sekasya sikkamanasya unyumangano sarinu kayasming patamangyanang takto anya anantara. To the learner, learning in pursuit of the straight path, first comes the knowledge of destruction and then immediately the certitude. Common, just offering the alternative translation by Ireland. For a learner who is training in conformity with the direct path, the knowledge of destruction arises first, and final knowledge immediately follows. <coughs> End of comment. It is the fruit of arahanship which gives him the certitude of the attainment of Nibbana. Here the word anantara has been used. That concentration proper to the fruit of arahanship is called anantarika samadhi. This means that the attainment of the fruit is immediate. Though it may be so in the case of the arahant, what about the stream winner, the sotapana, one may ask. There is a general belief that in the case of a sotapanna, the vision of Nibbana is like a glimpse of a distant lamp on a road with many bends, and the sotapanna has just negotiated the first bend. But in accordance with the Dhamma, it may be said that the norm of immediacy is applicable even to the knowledge of the first path. One who attains to the fruit of stream winning may be a beggar, an illiterate person, or a seven-year-old child. It may be that he has heard the Dhamma for the first time. All the same, a long line of epithets is used with reference to him in the suttas as his qualifications. Dikta Dhammo, Patta Dhammo, Vidita Dhammo, Pariyogala Dhammo, Tinna vichikicho, digata katankato, visaranjapatto, aparapanchayo sattu sasane. Did the Dhammo, 
He is one who has seen the Dhamma, the truth of Nibbana. It is said in the Ratana Sutta that along with the vision of the first path, three fetters are abundant, namely Sakankaya Ditti, the selfhood view, Vichikicca, skeptical doubt, and Silabhata Paramasa, attachment to holy vows and ascetic practices. Comment. I wanted to take this opportunity to say something in relation to a question asked by Paul Fulton on stream entry. He wanted to know what it actually means that the personality view fetter is abundant. My understanding is that the uh, experience of stream entry, the first experience of Nibbana, makes it utterly clear that there is no self. The experience of Nibbana is an experience that even though the individual has it at that moment, subjectively the individual feels that he or she was not there. And so when this experience has been had, it becomes impossible to uphold any kind of view about a self. However, the tendency to identify with things has not yet been overcome. This will only be overcome when one has reached full awakening, has become an arahant. So what the fetter that has been abandoned at this point is the theory that there could be a permanent self. And for the same reason of the extraordinariness of the experience of the eye of Dhamma, also all doubt has been removed, doubt about whether awakening is possible, because one has had the experience. And Silabhata Paramasa has also been left behind in the sense of holding on to morality and observances as the only means of purification, as a self-sufficient means of purification. One understands that morality is the indispensable foundation, but it is not in itself purification. The, I also like to bring in the translation of Siddhabhata by Bhikkhu Bodhi as behavior and observances and point out that in Dhammapada 271 we get this Na Siddhabhata Matena Bhikkhu Visasam Apadi Apampato Asavankayam Translation by K.R. Norman Not merely by virtuous conduct and vows has a bhikkhu attained confidence as long as he has not attained the destruction of the asavas? I think this makes it clear that Silabhata cannot be restricted to non-Buddhist observances. On the contrary, it is also a problem for a Buddhist practitioner. It is that idea of clinging to particular behavior and observances as the only means of purification, and it is the problem is the clinging. And there is uh, another passage from Anguttara Nikaya where I just like to offer Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. Suppose one cultivates behavior and observances, an austere lifestyle and a spiritual life, setting them up as if they were the essence. If unwholesome qualities then increase and wholesome qualities decline, such behavior and observances, austere lifestyle and spiritual life, set up as the essence, are fruitless. It's quite strong. Eh? But if unwholesome qualities decline and wholesome qualities increase, then such behavior and observances, austere lifestyle and spirit life, set up as the essence, are fruitful. I think this puts into perspective the, the idea of Silabhata Paramasa. The issue, as with so many other things, is the results. Are they wholesome? Or are they unwholesome? End of comment. Some might argue that only these feathers are abundant at this stage because it is a glimpse of Nibbana from a distance. But then there is this second epithet, Patta Dhammu, which means that he has reached the Dhamma, that he has arrived at Nibbana. Not only that, he is Vidita Dhammu. He is one who has understood the Dhamma, which is Nibbana. He is Pariyogala Dhamma. He has plunged into the Dhamma. He has dived into the Dhamma, which is Nibbana. He is Dinna He has crossed over doubts. 
Vigata Katankato, his waverings are gone. Visa Rajapato, he has attained to proficiency. Aparapanchayo Satantu Sasane, in regard to the dispensation of the teacher, he is not dependent on others. And that is to say, that he could attain to Nibbana even without another's help. Though, of course, with the teacher's help, he would attain it sooner. So this string of epithets testifies to the efficacy of the realization by the first path. It is not a mere glimpse of Nibbana from a distance. It is a reaching, an arrival or a plunge into Nibbana. Comment. I think this is very important to, to be the, the clarity Venamanyanananda here brings to the fact that the experience of Srimiti is an experience of Nibbana, nothing less. And this is what the Dhamma I refers to. End of comment. For purposes of illustration, we may bring in a legend connected with the history of Sri Lanka. It is said that when King Gajabahu invaded India, one of his soldiers, Nila, who had Herculean strength, parted the sea water with a huge iron bar in order to make way for the king and the army. Now when the supramundane path arises in the mind, the power of thought is as mighty as the blow of Nila with his iron bar. Even with the first blow, the sea water parted so that one could see the bottom. Similarly, the sweeping influxes are parted for a moment when the transcendental path arises in a mind, enabling one to see the very bottom, Nibbana. In other words, all preparations, sankaras, are stilled for a moment, enabling one to see the cessation of preparations. We have just given a simile by way of illustration, but incidentally there is a Dhammapada verse which comes close to it. Chinda Sotang Parakkamma Kame Panoda Brahmana Sankaranang Kayangnyatva Akatanyu Si Brahmana Strive forth and cut off the stream. Discard, O Brahmin, sense desires. Having known the destruction of preparations, O Brahmin, become a knower of the unmade. Comment, a translation by Norman. O Brahmin, cut across the stream making an effort, drive away sensual pleasures. Knowing the termination of conditioned things, you know the uncreated, or Brahman. And I'd just like to comment that here Brahman does not refer to the caste, but to the sense of somebody who is awakened. End of comment. So this verse clearly indicates what the knowledge of the path does when it arises. Just as one leaps forward and cuts off a stream of water, so it cuts off, even for a moment, the preparations connected with craving. Thereby one realizes the destruction of preparations, sankaranam kayangnyatva. Like the sea water, parted by the blow of the iron bar, preparations part for a moment to reveal the very bottom, which is unprepared the asankata. Akata, or the unmade, is the same as asankata, the unprepared. So one has had a momentary vision of the sea bottom, which is free from preparations. Of course, after that experience, influxes flow in again. But one kind of influxes, namely dipt asava, influxes of views, are gone for good and will never flow in again. Now, how was it that some with keen wisdom like Bahia attained Aranship even while listening to a short sermon from the Buddha? They had dealt four powerful blows in quick succession with the iron bar of the path knowledge to clear away all possible influxes. What is called Akata or Asankata, the unmade or the unprepared, is not something out there in a distance as an object of thought. It is not a sign to be grasped by one who wants to attain Nibbana. Comment. Sign here refers to the Nimitta. End of comment. 
Language encourages us to think in terms of signs. Very often we find it difficult to get rid of this habit. The world links with their defilements have to communicate with each other and the structure of the language has to answer their needs. So the subject-object relationship has become a very significant feature in a language. It always carries the implication that there is a thing to be grasped and that there is someone who grasps, that there is a doer and a thing done. So it is almost impossible to avoid such usages as I want to see Nibbana, I want to attain Nibbana. We are made to think in terms of getting and attaining. However, sometimes the Buddha reminds us that this is only a conventional usage and that these worldly usages are not to be taken too seriously. We come across such an instance in the Sagataka Vagga of the Samyutta Nikaya where the Buddha retorts to some questions put by a certain deity. The deity named Kakuda asked the Buddha, Do you rejoice, O recluse? And the Buddha retorts, On getting what, friend? Then the deity asks, Then, recluse, do you grieve? And the Buddha quips back, On losing what, friend? So the deity concludes, Well then, recluse, you neither rejoice nor grieve. And the Buddha replies, That is so, friend. It seems then that though we say we attain Nibbana, there is nothing to gain and nothing to lose. If anything, what is lost is an ignorance that there is something and a craving that there is not enough. And that is all one loses. Now there are quite a number of synonyms for Nibbana, such as Akata and Asankata. As already mentioned, there is even a list of 33 such epithets out of which one is deeper. Now, deeper means an island. When we are told that Nibbana is an island, we intend to imagine some sort of existence in a beautiful island. But in the Parayana Vanga of the Sutta Nipata, the Buddha gives a good corrective to that kind of imagining. In his reply to a question put by the Brahmin youth Kappa, a pupil of Bhavari, Kappa puts his question in the following impressive words. Manje sarasming tittatang oghe jati mahabhaye jaramatju paritanang deepang pabruhi marisan tranchami deepang akhai yathaidang naparang siya. Unto them that stand midstream when the frightful floods flow forth. To them in decay and death forlorn, an island, sire, may you proclaim. An island which none else excels, yes, yeah, such an isle, please tell me, sire. And the Buddha gives his answer in two inspiring verses. Manje sarasming tittatang, oge jati mahabhaye. Jaramanchu paritanang deepang pabrumi kapate akinchanang anadanang etang deepang anaparang nibbanang itinang brumi jaramanchu parikayam. Unto them that stand mid stream when the frightful floods flow forth, to them in decay and death forlorn, an island kappa I shall proclaim. Owning not, grasping not. The isle is this, none else besides. Nibbana, that is how I call that isle, wherein is decay, decay, and death is death. Comment. I present here Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation of this very beautiful verse which points right to, to the essence of Nibbana in this island imagery. For those standing in the midst of the stream, Kappa said the Blessed One, when a perilous flood has arisen, for those oppressed by old age and death, let me declare an island to you, owning nothing, taking nothing. This is the island with nothing further. I call this Nibbana, the extinction of old age and death. 
Having understood this, those mindful ones are quenched in this very life. They do not come under Mara's control, nor are they Mara's footmen. End of comment. Akinchanang means owning nothing. Anadanang means grasping nothing. Itang di panganaparang. This is the island, nothing else. Nippanang itinang brumi jara manchu parikayang. And that I call nibbana, which is the extinction of decay and death. From this also we can infer that words like akata, Asankata and Sabbasankara Samata are full-fledged synonyms of Nibbana. Nibbana is not some mysterious state quite apart from them. It is not something to be projected into a distance. Some are in the habit of getting down to a discussion on Nibbana <coughs> by putting Sankata on one side and Asankata on the other side. They start by saying that Sankata or the prepared is Anicca or impermanent. If Sankata is Anicca, they conclude that Asankata must be Nicca, that is, the unprepared must be permanent. Following the same line of argument, they argue that since Sankata is Dukkha, Asankata must be Sukha. Comment. This is about happiness and uh, unsatisfactoriness. End of comment. But when they come to the third step, they get into difficulties. If Sankata is Anatta or not Self, then surely Asankata must be Atta or Self. At this point they have to admit that their argument is too facile, and so they end up by saying that after all Nibbana is something to be realized. All this confusion arises due to a lack of understanding of the law of dependent arising, Paticca Samuppada. Therefore, first of all, we have to say something about the doctrine of Paticca Samuppada. According to the Arya Pariyesana Sutta of the Majjhima Nikaya, the Buddha, soon after his enlightenment, reflected on the profundity of the Dhamma and was rather disinclined to preach it. He saw two points in the doctrine that are difficult for the world to see or grasp. One was Paticca Samuppada. Dudda Sangirang Thanang Yadidang Ida Pachyata Paticca Samuppada. Hard to see is this point, namely dependent arising, which is a relatedness of this to that. And the second point was Nibbana. Idam pikotanang dudndasang yadidang sabbasankara samato sabupari patinisango tanakayo virago nirodho nibbanang. And this point too is difficult to see, namely the stilling of all preparations, the relinquishment of all assets, the destruction of craving, detachment, cessation, extinction. Comment. Here I offer the translation by Nyana Moli. It is hard for such a generation to see this truth, namely specific conditionality, dependent origination. And it is hard to see this truth, namely the stilling of all formations, the relinquishment of all acquisitions, the destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation, nibbana. In relation to this beautiful passage, I have the uh, I would like to say that all of this is not found in the Madhyama Agama parallel. The entire idea that the Buddha hesitated and that Brahma had to intervene to convince him to teach is not found in the parallel at all. I have discussed this in an article and I will make this article also available. As far as I can see, um, we cannot be certain which of the two presentations is the earlier one, but there are some arguments that could be made in favor of the Chinese parallel version. Although we cannot be sure, this at least means that the whole idea that the Buddha hesitated and was not willing to teach and the whole reflection that we have just looking at, we cannot be certain whether this is really the earliest version of what happened after the Buddha had realized awakening. End of comment. From this context we can gather 
that if there is any term we can use to define Patitnachasamuppada, a term that comes closer to it in meaning, it is Ida Pachayata. <coughs> the Buddha himself has described Patitnachasamuppada in this context as a relatedness of this to that Ida Pachayata. As a matter of fact, the basic principle which forms the noble norm of this doctrine of dependent arising is this Ida Pachayata. Let us not try to get at its meaning by examining the doctrine of Paticca Samuppada. In quite a number of contexts, <coughs> such as the Baudhatuka Sutta of the Majjhimanikaya and the Bodhivanga of the Udana, the law of Paticca Samuppada is set out in the following manner. Iti imasming sati idang hoti, imasupada idang upanjati. Imasming asati idang nahoti, imasa niruddha idang nirudhjati. Yadidang avinja pachaya sankara, sankara pachaya vinyana, vinyana pachaya nama rupa, nama rupa pachaya salayatana, salayatana pachaya phasso, phasso pachaya vidana, vidana pachaya tanha. Tanha panchaya upadana, upadana panchaya bhavo, bhava panchaya jati, jati panchaya jaramaranam, soka parideva dukka dumanasupayasa sambhavanti, eva metasa kevalasa dukka kandasa samudayo hoti, aviyaya tveva asesa viraga nirudha sankara nirudho. Sankara Nirudha Vinyana Nirudho Vinyana Nirudha Nama Rupa Nirudho Nama Rupa Nirudha Salayatana Nirudho Salayatana Nirudha Pasa Nirudho Pasa Nirudha Vedana Nirudho Vedana Nirudha Tanha Nirudho Tanha Nirudha Upadana Nirudho Upadana Nirudha Bhava Nirudho Bhava Nirodha Jati Nirodha Jati Nirodha Jaramaranam Soka Parideva Dukka Dumana Supayasa Nirodhjanti Eva Metasa Kivalasa Dukka Kandasa Nirodho Hoti Thus, this being, this comes to be. With the rising of this, this arises. <coughs> this not being, this does not come to be. With the cessation of this, this ceases. And that is to say, dependent on ignorance, preparations come to be. Dependent on preparations, consciousness. Dependent on consciousness, name and form. Dependent on name and form, the six sense bases. Dependent on the six sense bases, contact. Dependent on contact, feeling. Dependent on feeling, craving. Dependent on craving, grasping. Dependent on grasping, becoming. Dependent on becoming birth, dependent on birth, decay and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair come to be. Thus is the rising of this entire mass of suffering. But with the complete fading away and cessation of ignorance comes the cessation of preparations. <coughs> with the cessation of preparations, the cessation of consciousness. With the cessation of consciousness, the cessation of name and form. With the cessation of name and form, the cessation of the six sense bases. With the cessation of the six sense bases, the cessation of contact. With the cessation of contact, the cessation of feeling. With the cessation of feeling, the cessation of craving. With the cessation of craving, the cessation of grasping. With the cessation of grasping, the cessation of becoming. With the cessation of becoming, the cessation of birth. With the cessation of birth, the cessation of decay and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair cease to be. Thus is the cessation of this entire mass of suffering. Comment. I'd just like to mention a very fascinating article by Yurovich uh, playing with fire, the Pratitya Samutpada from the perspective of Vedic thought. I will make this also available uh, on the forum. Uh, where she points out similarities between a Vedic creation myth and the first links independent rising. <coughs> and this is significant in so far as it helps us to 
understand the particular individual links as standing to some extent in dialogue with existing ideas in the ancient Indian background. In other words, the Buddha would have chosen this particular series of links because in order to make uh, uh, to be more easily understood. And the real point of Patija Samupada is not so much these particular 12 links in their sequence, also it's of course significant, but the real point, and this is also what the point uh, Venerable Jnananda makes, is the, the basic principle, the Ida Pachayata. End of comment. This is the thematic statement of the law of Paticca Samuppada. <clears throat> it is set out here in the form of a fundamental principle. Imasming sati idam hoti. This being, this comes to be. Imasu pada idam upanjati. With the rising of this, this arises. Imasming asati idam nahoti. This not being, this does not come to be. Imasa nirodha idam nirudjati. With the cessation of this, this ceases. It resembles an algebraical formula. And then we have the conjunctive yadidam, which means namely this, or that is to say. This shows that the foregoing statement is axiomatic and implies that what follows is an illustration. So the 12 linked formula beginning with the words avinja pachaya sankara is that illustration no doubt the 12 linked formula is impressive enough but the important thing here is the basic principle involved and that is the fourfold statement beginning with imasming sati this fact is very clearly brought out in a certain sutta in the nidana vanga of the samyutta nikaya there the buddha addresses the monks and says Paticca samuppadancha vo bhikkave desesami paticca samuppanne cha dhamme. Monks, I will teach you dependent arising and things that are dependently arisen. In this particular context, <coughs> the Buddha makes a distinction between dependent arising and things that are dependently arisen. In order to explain what is meant by dependent arising or paticca samuppada, he takes up the last two links in the formula, in the words Jati Pachaya Bhikave Jara Maranam. Monks, dependent on birth is decay and death. Then he draws attention to the importance of the basic principle involved. Upampadava Tathagatanam Anupampadava Tathagatanam Tittavasa Dhatu Dhamma Tittata Dhamma Niyamata Ida Pachayata, etc. Out of the long exhortation given there, this is the part relevant to us here. Jati Pachaya Bhikkavi Jara Maranam. Dependent on birth or monks is decay and death. And that is to say that decay and death has birth as its condition. Upampadava Tathagatanam Anupampadava Tathagatanam. Whether there be an arising of the Tathagatas or whether there be no such arising. That elementary nature, that orderliness of the Dhamma, that norm of the Dhamma, the relatedness of this to that, stands as it is. Comment. I am here translating the parallel from the Samyukta Arama. Whether a Buddha emerges in the world, or whether he has not emerged in the world, this Dharma remains invariable. The Dharma which remains, the element of the Dharma, is what the Tathagata realizes himself by accomplishing right awakening. He teaches it to people, elucidating and clarifying it, namely, conditioned by ignorance are formations, etc. So it is significant that in the Chinese parallel, the reference to Ida Pachigata is not found. End of comment. So from this it is clear that the underlying principle could be understood even with the help of a couple of links. But the commentary seems to have ignored this fact in its definition of the Idapun Pachayata. It says, Imesang jara marana dinang pachaya idapun pachaya idapun pachaya va idapachayata. The word imesang is in the plural. 
and this indicates that the commentary has taken the dependence in a collective sense. But it is because of the fact that even two links are sufficient to illustrate the law that the Buddha follows it up with the declaration that this is the Paticca Samuppada. <coughs> and then he goes on to explain what is meant by things dependently risen. Katamecha bhikkave paticca samapanna dhamma Charamaranang bhikkave anicchang sankatam paticca samapannam khaya dhammam vaya dhammam viraga dhammam niroda dhammam What monks are things dependently arisen? And then, taking up just one of the last links, he declares, Decay and death, monks, is impermanent, prepared, dependently arisen, of a nature to get destroyed, to pass away, fade away, and cease. By the way, the word viraga usually means detachment or dispassion. But in such context as avidya viraga and pitiyacha viraga, one has to render it by words like fading away. So that avidya viraga could be rendered as by the fading away of ignorance. And pitiya viraga would mean by the fading away of joy. It seems then that decay and death themselves are impermanent, that they are prepared or made up, that they are dependently arisen. Decay and death themselves can get destroyed and pass away. Decay as well as death can fade away and cease. Then the Buddha takes up the preceding link, jati or birth. And that too is given the same qualifications. In the same manner, he takes up each of the preceding links up to and including ignorance, avidya, and applies to them the above qualifications. It is significant that every one of the twelve links, even ignorance, is said to be independently arisen. <coughs> Let us try to understand how, for instance, decay and death themselves can get destroyed or pass away. Taking the Ida Pachyata formula as a paradigm, we can illustrate the relationship between the two links birth and decay and death. Instead of saying this being that comes to be, and so forth, now we have to say birth being, decay and death comes to be. With the arising of birth, decay and death arises. Birth not being, decay and death does not come to be. With the cessation of birth, decay and death ceases. Now birth itself is an arising, but here we can't help saying that birth arises. It is like saying that birth is born. How can get birth get born? Similarly, death is a passing away, but here we have to say that death itself passes away. How can death pass away? Perhaps as we proceed, we might get the answers to these questions. Now at this point, let us take up for discussion a certain significant passage in the Mahanidana Sutta of the Diga Nikaya. In the course of an exposition of the law of Paticca Samuppada addressed to Venera Ananda, the Buddha makes the following statement. Etntavata ko ananda jayatava jiyatava niyatava chavetava upapanjitava Etntavata adivachana patu, etntavata nirutti patu, etntavata panyati patu, etntavata panyavacharang, etntavata vattang vattati ittattang panyapanaya, yadidang nama rupang saha vinyanena. In so far only ananda can one be born or grow old or die or pass away or reappear. In so far only is there any pathway for verbal expression. In so far only is there any pathway for terminology. In so far only is there any pathway for designation. In so far only is the range of wisdom. In so far only is the round kept going for there to be a designation of the thisness, that is to say, name and form together with consciousness. Comment just want to offer an alternative translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. It is to this extent, Ananda, that one can be born, age and die, pass away and realize. To this extent, there is a pathway for designation. To this extent, that there is a pathway for language. 
to this extent that there's a pathway for description, to this extent that there's a sphere for wisdom, to this extent that this round turns for describing this state of being. End of comment. We have rendered the term ittata by thisness, and what it means will become clear as we go on. In the above quotation, the word ittavata, which means in so far only, has as its point of reference the concluding phrase yadidang nama rupang saha vinyanena, that is to say, name and form together with consciousness. So the statement as it is expresses a complete idea. But some addition have an additional phrase, Anya Manya Pacheta Pavattati, exists in a mutual relationship. This phrase is obviously superfluous and is probably a commentary addition. <coughs> what is meant by the Buddha's statement is that name and form, together with consciousness, is the rallying point for all concepts of birth, decay, death and rebirth. All pathways for verbal expression, terminology and designation converge on name and form together with consciousness. The range of wisdom extends only up to the relationship between these two. And it is between these two that there is a whirling round, so that one may point out a thisness. In short, the secret of the entire samsaric existence is to be found in this whirlpool. Vatta and Avatta are words used for a whirlpool. We shall be bringing up quotations in support of that meaning. It seems, however, that this meaning has got obscured in the course of time. In the commentaries and in some modern translation, there is quite a lot of confusion with regard to the meaning of the phrase Vatta Vattati. In fact, one Sinhala translation renders it as samsaric rain. What rain has to do with samsara is a matter for conjecture. What is actually meant by vattang vattati is a whirling round, and samsara, even literally, is that. Here we are told that there is a whirling round between name and form and consciousness, and this is the samsaric whirlpool to which all the aforesaid things are traceable. Already in the first sermon, we try to show that name in name and form has to do with names and concepts. Now, from this context, it becomes clear that all pathways for verbal expression, terminology and designation converge on this whirlpool between name and form and consciousness. Now that we have attached so much significance to a whirlpool, let us try to understand how a whirlpool is formed. Let us try to get at the natural laws underlying its formations. How does a whirlpool come to be? Suppose a river is flowing downward. To flow downward is in the nature of a river. But a certain current of water thinks I can and must move upstream. And so it pushes on against the main stream. But at a certain point, its progress is checked by the mainstream and thrust aside, only to come round and make a fresh attempt, again and again. All these obstinate and unsuccessful attempts gradually lead to a whirling round. As time goes on, the runaway current understands, as it were, that it cannot move forward, but it does not give up. It finds an alternative aim in moving towards the bottom. <clears throat> so it spirals downward, funnel-like, digging deeper and deeper towards the bottom, until an abyss is formed. Here then we have a whirlpool. While all this is going on, there is a crying need to fill up the chasm, and the whirlpool develops the necessary force of attraction to cater to it. It attracts and grasps everything that comes within its reach, and sends it whirling down funnel-like into the chasm. The whirling goes on at a tremendous speed, while the circumference grows larger and larger. At last the whirlpool becomes a center of a tremendous amount of activity. While this kind of activity is going on in a river or a sea, there is a possibility for us to point it out 
as that place or this place. Why? Because there is an activity going on. Usually in the world, the place where an activity is going on is known as a unit, a center or an institution. Since the whirlpool is also a center of activity, we may designate it as a here or there. We may even personify it. With reference to it, we can open up pathways for verbal expression, terminology and designation. But if we are to consider the form of activity that is going on here, what is it after all? It is only a perversion. That obstinate current thought to itself, out of delusion and ignorance, I can and must move upstream. And so it tried and failed, but turned round only to make the same vain attempt again and again. Ironically enough, even its progress towards the bottom is a stagnation. So here we have ignorance on one side and craving on the other, as a result of the abyss formed by the whirlpool. In order to satisfy this craving, there is that power of attraction, grasping. Where there is grasping, there is existence or bhava. The entire whirlpool now appears as a center of activity. Now the basic principle underlying this whirlpool is to be found in our bodies. What we call breathing is a continuous process of emptying and filling up. So even the so-called life principle is not much different from the activity of a whirlpool. The functioning of the lungs and the heart is based on the same principle and the blood circulation is in fact a whirling round. This kind of activity is very often known as automatic, a word, a word which has connotations of self-sufficiency. But at the root of it there is a perversion, as we saw in the case of the whirlpool. All these activities are based on a conflict between two opposite forces. In fact, existence in its entirety is not much different from the conflict of that obstinate current of water with the mainstream. This characteristic of conflict is so pervasive that it can be seen even in the basic laws governing the existence of a society. In our social life, rights and responsibilities go hand in hand. We can enjoy certain privileges provided we fulfill our duties. So here, too, we have a tangle within and a tangle without. Now this is about the existence of the society as such. And what about the field of economics? There, too, the basic principles show the same weakness. Production is governed by the laws of supply and demand. There will be a supply so long as there is a demand. Between them, there is a conflict. It leads to many complications. The price mechanism is on a precarious balance, and that is why some wealthy countries are forced to the ridiculous position of dumping their surplus into the sea. All this shows that existence is basically in a precarious position. To illustrate this, let us take the case of two snakes of the same size, trying to swallow up each other. Each of them tries to swallow up the other from the tail upwards. And when they are halfway through the meal, what do we find? A snake cycle. This snake cycle goes round and round, trying to swallow up each other. But will it ever be successful? The precarious position illustrated by the snake cycle we find in our own bodies in the form of respiration, blood circulation and so forth. What appears as the stability in the society and in the economy is similarly precarious. It is because of this conflict, this unsatisfactoriness, that the Buddha concluded that the whole of existence is suffering. When the arising aspect is taken too seriously, to the neglect of the cessation aspect, instead of a conflict or an unsatisfactoriness, one tends to see something automatic everywhere. This body, as well as machines such as water pumps and electric appliances, seem to work on an automatic principle but in truth, there is only a conflict between two opposing forces. When one comes to think of it, there is no autoness even in the automatic. All that is there is a bearing up with difficulty. And this in fact is the meaning of the word Dukkha, 
du stands for difficulty and ka for bearing up. Even with difficulty, one bears it up. And though one bears it up, it is difficult. Now regarding the question of existence, <clears throat> we happen to mention that because of a whirlpool's activity, one can point out a here with reference to it. We can now come back to the word ittatam, which we left out without comment in the quotation ettavata vattang vattati ittatam panyapanaya. In so far only does the whirlpool whirl for the designation of an ittatta. Now what is this ittatta? Itta means this, so ittatang would mean thisness. The whirling of a whirlpool qualifies itself for a designation as a this. There are a couple of verses in the Dvayatana Pasana Sutta of the Sutta Nipata, which bring out the meaning of this word more clearly. Jadi marana sangsaran ye bhajanti punapunam itha bhavanyata bhavam avijjayeva sagati tanha dutiyo puriso dighang adhana sangsaran itha bhavanyata bhavam sangsaran nati vattati ye jadi marana sangsaran punapunam bhajanti they that go on again and again the round of birth and death. Itta bhavanyatta bhavang, which is a thisness and an otherwiseness, or which is an alternation between a thisness and an otherwiseness. Sagati avijaya evam, that going of them, that flying of them, is only a journey of ignorance. Tanha dutiyo puriso, the man with craving as his second or his companion. Dighang adhana sangsaran, faring on for a long time in sangsara. Itta bhavanyata bhavan sangsaran nati vattati. Does not get away from the round, which is a thisness and an otherwiseness, or which is an alternation between a thisness and an otherwiseness. What is meant by it? is the transcendence of samsara. Comment. I just offer Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation from his forthcoming Sotanipata. Those who travel again and again in the samsara of birth and death, which is becoming thus, becoming otherwise, that journey is due to ignorance. With craving as partner a person wandering on this long journey does not transcend samsara, which is becoming thus, becoming otherwise. I also wanted to mention that uh, the verse on Tanha Dutiyopuri So Itta Bhavanyata Bhavang recurs in the Anguttara Nikaya, and there the Pali Text Society's prose speaks of craving that is Itta Bhava, Iti Bhava Bhava Hetu, translated by Bhikkhu Bodhi as for the sake of life here or elsewhere. So this just gives another dimension of this itta bhava anyata bhava, which has more this kind of sense of a form of existence. End of comment. We saw above how the concept of a here arose with the birth of a whirlpool. In fact, one's birth is at the same time the birth of a here or this place, and this is what is meant by itta bhava in the two verses quoted above. Itta bhava and ittata both mean thisness. In both verses, this thisness is coupled with an otherwiseness, anyata bhava. Here too we see a conflict between two things, thisness and otherwiseness. The cycle of samsara, represented by birth and death, jati marana samsara, is equivalent to an alternation between thisness and otherwiseness, itta bhava anyata bhava. And, as the first verse says, this recurrent alternation between thisness and otherwiseness is nothing but a journey of ignorance itself. Though we have given so much significance to the terms itta bhava and anyata bhava, the commentary to the Sutta Nipata treats them lightly. It explains itta bhava as immang manusa bhava, which means this state as a human being and anyata bhava as itu avasesa anya nikaya bhava, any state of being other than this. 
This explanation misses the deeper significance of the word itata. In support of this, we may refer to the Padika Sutta of the Diga Nikaya. There we are told that the, when the world system gets destroyed at the end of an eon, some being or other gets reborn in an empty Brahma mansion. And after being there for a long time, things, out of a feeling of loneliness, How nice it would be if other beings also come to this state. In this context, the word ittata refers to the Brahma world and not to the human world. From the point of view of the Brahmas, ittata refers to the Brahma world and only for us here it means the human world. However, this is just a narrow meaning of the word ittata. When the reference is to the entire round of existence or samsara, ittata does not necessarily mean this human world. The two terms have a generic sense because they rep represent some basic principle. As in the case of a whirlpool, thisness is to be seen together with an otherwiseness. This illustrates the conflict characteristic of existence. Wherever a thisness arises, a possibility for an otherwiseness comes in. Itta, bhava and anyata, bhava go together. Anicchata, or impermanence, is very often explained with the help of the phrase Vipari Namanyata Bhava. Now here too we have the word Anyata Bhava. Here the word preceding it gives a clue to its true significance. Vipari Nama is quite suggestive of a process of evolution. <coughs> Strictly speaking, Parinama is evolution and Parinata is the fully evolved or mature stage. The prefix V stands for the anticlimax. The evolution is over. Now it is becoming other. Ironically enough, this state of becoming other is known as otherwiseness, anyata bhava. And so this twin, itta bhava and anyata bhava, tell us the nature of the world. Between them, they explain for us the law of impermanence. In the section of the threes in the Anguttara Nikaya, the three characteristics of a Sankata are explained in this order. Upparu panyayati, vaya panyayati, tittas anyatatang panyayati. An arising is manifest, a passing away is manifest, and an otherwiseness in the persisting is manifest. Comment. This passage is particularly important because it shows that uh, uh, the theory of momentariness is a later development. This theory has been studied in detail by Alexander von Rosbart in a monograph called The Buddhist Doctrine of Momentariness. And he uh, found that the idea that everything disappears right after having arisen is uh, an idea that came into being towards the ending of the Abhidharma period, so too late to find its way even into the canonical Abhidharma uh, texts. But this idea is very prominent in later tradition and has led to a whole range of uh, developments. From an early Buddhist viewpoint, as we can see very clearly in this quote from the Anguttara Nikaya, there is uh, something that lasts for some time. Also, this is all the time changing. But it does not mean that everything, as soon as it appears, immediately completely disappears. And the simile I like to use to illustrate the difference is, think of a river, constant change. But it's not that the river appears and disappears. Now think of a lamp that is flickering, appearing, disappearing, appearing, disappearing. These two images would illustrate the different conceptions of impermanence held in early Buddhism, like a river, and later tradition, the flickering of a lamp, the idea of momentariness. End of comment. This implies that the persistence is only apparent, and that is why it is mentioned last. <clears throat> there is an otherwiseness even in this apparently persistent. But later scholars prefer to speak of three stages as upada, titti, bhanga, arising, persistence, and breaking up. However, the law of impermanence could be sufficiently understood even with the help of two words, itta, bhava, and anyatta, bhava, thisness, and otherwiseness. 
Very often, we find the Buddha summing up the law of impermanence in the two words Samudaya and Bhaya, arising and passing away. There is an apparent contradiction in the phrase Tittasa Anyattata, but it reminds us of the fact that what the world takes as static or persisting is actually not so. The so-called static is from beginning to end and otherwiseness. Now if we are to relate this to the two links Jati and Jaramaranam in Paticca Samuppada, <coughs> we may say that as soon as one is born, the process of otherwiseness sets in. Wherever there is birth, there is death. One of the traditional Pali verses on the reflections on death has the following meaningful lines. Upampatiya sahavedang maranam agata sada. Always death has come, even with the birth itself. Just as in a conjoined pair, when one is drawn, the other follows. Even so, when birth is drawn in, decay and death follow as a matter of course. Before the advent of the Buddha, the world believed in the possibility of a birth devoid of decay and death. It believed in a form of existence devoid of grasping, because of its ignorance of the pairwise relatedness of this to that. Ida Pachayata. It went on with its deluded search, <coughs> and that was the reason for all the conflict in the world. According to the teaching of the Buddha, the concept of birth is equivalent to the concept of a hearing. As a matter of fact, this birth of a hearing is like the first peg driven for the measurement of a world. Because of the pairwise relationship, the, first, the very first birthday present that one gets as soon as one is born is death, the inevitable death that he is entitled to. This way we can understand the deeper significance of the two words itta bhava and anyatta bhava, thisness and otherwiseness. We have to say the same thing with regard to the whirlpool. <clears throat> Apparently it has the power to control, to hold sway. Seen from a distance, the whirlpool is the center of activity with some controlling power. Now, one of the basic meanings of the concept of self is the ability to control to hold sway. And a whirlpool, too, as seen from a distance, seems to have this ability. Just as it appears automatic, so also it seems to have some power to control. But on deeper analysis it reveals its not-self nature. What we have here is simply the conflict between the mainstream and the runaway current. It is the outcome of the conflict between two forces and not the work of just one force. It is a case of relatedness of this to that, Ida Pachyata. As one verse in the Balavaga of the Dhammapara puts it, Atta hi atta no nati. Even oneself is not one's own. So even a whirlpool is not its own. <clears throat> there is nothing really automatic about it. This then is the dukkha, the suffering, the conflict the unsatisfactoriness. And what the world holds on to as existence is just the process of otherwiseness, as the Buddha vividly portrays for us in the following words of the Nandavaga of Udana. Ayang loko santapajato pasapareto rogang varati attato yena yena hi manyati tatotang hoti anyata Anyata bhavi bhava sattu loko bhava pareto bhava me vabi nandati yat abhi nandati tat bhayam yasa bhayati tang dukkham bhava vipahana ya ko panidang brahmacharyam vusati. This anguished world, fully given to contact, speaks of a disease as self. In whatever terms it conceives of, even thereby it turns otherwise. The world, attached to becoming, given fully to becoming, though becoming otherwise, yet delights in becoming. <coughs> what it delights in is a fear, what it fears from is a suffering, but then this holy life is lived for the wandering of that very becoming. Comment, just like to offer the alternative translation by Ireland. This world is subject to torment, afflicted by contact it calls a disease self. 
for however it is conceived, it is ever other than that. Becoming something other, the world is held by being, is afflicted by being, yet delights in being. But what it delights in brings fear, and what it fears is suffering. Now this whole life is lived in order to abandon being. End of comment. Just a few lines, but how deep they go. The world is in anguish and is enslaved by contact. What it calls self is nothing but a disease. Manyati is a word of deeper significance. Manyana is conceiving under the influence of craving, conceit and views. Whatever becomes an object of that conceiving, by that very conception it becomes otherwise. That is to say that an opportunity arises for an otherwiseness, even as death has come together with birth. So conceiving or conception is itself the reason for otherwiseness. Before a thing becomes otherwise, it has to become a thing. And it becomes a thing only when attention is focused on it under the influence of craving, conceit and views. And it is separated from the whole world and grasped as a thing. And that is why it is said, Yang yang hi lokasming upadiyanti ten eva maro anveti jantung. Whatever one grasps in the world, by that itself Mara pursues a being. Comment, Bhikkhu Bodhis translation. Whatever they cling to in the world, by this itself Mara pursues a person. End of comment. The, word is a, the world is attached to becoming and is fully given to becoming. Therefore its very nature is otherwiseness, anyata bhavi. And then the Buddha declares the inevitable outcome of this contradictory position. Yat abhinanati tang bhayam. Whatever one delights in, that is a fear, that is a danger. And what one delights in is becoming, and that is a source of fear. And yasa bhayati tang dukkham. What one fears or is afraid of, that is suffering. And of what is one afraid? One is afraid of the otherwiseness of the thing that one holds on to as existing. And so the otherwiseness is the suffering, and the thing grasps is a source of fear. For instance, <clears throat> when one is walking through a town with one's pockets full of gems, one is afraid because of the valuables in one's pockets. Even so, the existence that one delights in is a source of fear. What one fears is change or otherwiseness, and that is suffering. Therefore it is that this holy life is lived for the abandonment of that very becoming or existence. So from this quotation it becomes clear that the nature of existence is otherwiseness. It is the insight into this nature that is basic in the understanding of Idapapajayata. What is known as the arising of the Dhamma I is the understanding of this predicament in worldly existence. But that Dhamma I arises together with the solution for this predicament. Yang Kinchi Samudaya Dhammam Sapbang Tang Nirodha Dhammam. Whatever is of a nature to arise, all that is of a nature to cease. As far as the arising aspect is concerned, this whirlpool is formed due to the grasping through craving, conceit and views. Once this sangsadic whirlpool is formed, it keeps on attracting all that is in the world, all that is within its reach, in the form of craving and grasping. But there is a cessation to this process. It is possible to make it cease. Why? Because it is something arisen due to causes and conditions. <coughs> Because it is a process based on two things, without a self to hold sway. That is why we have mentioned at the very outset that everything is impermanent, prepared, and dependently arisen. Anichang sankatang paticca samopanna. Every one of the twelve links in the formula, including ignorance, is dependently arisen. They are all arisen due to causes and conditions. They are not permanent, anicchang. They are only made up or prepared, sankatang. The word sankatang is explained in various ways, but in short it means something that is made up, 
prepared or concocted by way of intention. Paticca samuppanna means conditionally arisen, and therefore it is of a nature to get destroyed. Kaya dhamma. It is of a nature to pass away. Vaya dhamma. It is of a nature to fade away. Viraga dhamma. It is of a nature to cease. Nirodha dhamma. It seems that even the color or shade of decay and death can fade away. And that is why we have pointed out their relevance to the question of concepts. This nature of fading away is understood by one who has had an insight into the law of arising and cessation. Sangsara is a whirlpool as far as the ordinary beings caught up in it are concerned. Now what about the Arahants? How is the idea of this whirlpool presented in the case of the Arahants? It is simply said that for them there is no whirling round for there to be a designation. Pattang te sang natti panya panaya. So in their case, there is no whirling round to justify a designation. This then is something deeper than the whirlpool itself. The whirlpool can be pointed out because of its activity, but not so easily the emancipated ones. And that is why there is so much controversy regarding the nature of the Tathagata. The image of the whirlpool in its relation to the emancipated ones is beautifully presented in the following verse from the Chula Bhag of Yudana. Achechivattam vyagani rasam visukka saritana sandati chinnam vattam na vattati esif anto dukkasam <coughs> He has cut off the whirlpool and which desirelessness. The stream dried up now no longer flows. The whirlpool cut off worlds no more. This, even this, is suffering's end. Comment, I just like to offer the translation by Ireland. He has cut the round, won the desireless. The dried up river flows no more. The severed round does not revolve. This is the end of suffering. End of comment. <coughs> what has the Arhan done? He has cut off the whirlpool. He has preached it and has reached the desireless state. The stream of craving is dried up and flows no more. The whirlpool cut off at the root no more worlds. And this is the end of suffering. The cutting off of the whirlpool is the realization of cessation, which is arahanthood. It is because of the accent on the arising aspect that the current tries to move against the mainstream. When that attempt is given up, the rest happens as a matter of course. This idea is even more clearly brought out by the following two verses in the Sagata Vaga of the Samyutta Nikaya. They are in the form of a dialogue between a deity and the Buddha. The deity asks, Kuttu sarani vattanti katha vattang navattati katha namanche rupanche asesam uparujjati From where do currents turn back? Were worlds no more the whirlpool? <coughs> Where is it that name and form is held in check in a way complete? The Buddha gives the answer in the following verse. Yatha avo chapattavi techo vayona gadhati ato sarani vattanti etha vattang navattati etha namanche rupanche asesam uparudhyati Where earth and water, fire and wind, no footing find. From there it is that currents turn back. There the whirlpool whirls no more, and there it is that name and form is held in check in a way complete. Comment, um, Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. Where water, earth, fire and air do not gain a footing, it is from here that the streams turn back, here that the round no longer revolves. Here name and form ceases, stops without remainder. End of comment. The reference here is to Nibbana. Whether it is called Sabha Sankara Samatha, the stilling of all preparations, or Asankata Dhatu, the unprepared element, it means the state of cessation. And when the Arhan's mind is in that state, the four elements, which are like ghosts, do not haunt him. They do not get a footing in that consciousness. <coughs> When they fade away due to detachment, those currents do not flow 
and the whirlpool whirls no more. Name and form are fully held in check there. Now, as far as the meaning of Rupa in Nama Rupa in this reference is concerned, its definition as Chattari cha Mahabhotani Chattunan cha Mahabhotana Upadaya Rupa is quite significant. It draws attention to the fact that the four great primaries underlie the concept of form. This is something unique, since before the advent of the Buddha, the world thought that in order to get away from Rupa, one has to grasp Arupa. Comment, Arupa means immaterial. End of comment. But the irony of the situation is that even in Arupa, Rupa is implicit in a subtle form. Or, in other words, Arupa takes Rupa for granted. Supposing someone walking in the darkness of the night has a hallucination of a devil and runs away to escape from it. He thinks he is running away from the devil, but he is taking the devil with him. The devil is in his mind. It is something imagined. Similarly, until the Buddha came into the scene, the worldlings grasped Arupa in order to get away from Rupa. But because of the dichotomy between Rupa and Arupa, even when they swung, as far as the highest formless realms, they were still in bondage to sankharas or preparations. As soon as the momentum of their swing of sankharas got fully spent, they swung back to Rupa. So here too we see the question of duality and dichotomy. This sermon has served its purpose if it has drawn attention to the importance of the question of duality, dichotomy and the relatedness of this to that, Ida Pacheta. So this is enough for today. <coughs> Comment. Again, it is difficult to bring the various points that the Venerable Yanananda has presented here together, but I think one topic that I find particularly striking in this presentation is dependent arising, Paticca Samuppada. Uh, 